by splicing together various parts. How does industry help transform farm methods? Industry on Parade, Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Ripe, rich peaches on their way to the nation's kitchens. Oranges packed with vitamins following the same route. These fruits of America's bountiful agriculture are more uniformly appealing and nutritious today than they were only a few years ago. So are onions, and so, in fact, are all the foodstuffs we grow. The quality of the harvest is better because research and new industrial products and techniques have given man unprecedented power actually to improve agricultural output, both in quality and quantity. Sometimes our ability to control life processes yields unusual results, as with this giant ear of corn. Not good for eating, it was developed specifically for use in the manufacture of corn cob pipes. The crop here at Summit Hall Turf Farm in Maryland is a special breed of grass. It spreads quickly, crowding out weeds and forming a tough grass cover that needs cutting only once a month or so. Such lawns are started from two-inch plugs, like these being boxed for shipment. The greenhouse research headquarters of Jackson and Perkins in Newark, New York, is a good place to see firsthand the way in which old plants are improved and new ones created by cross-breeding. Here, the expert collects pollen from a rose he intends to cross with another to produce a new hybrid, one of 10,000 new varieties of roses the company develops each year. Now the pollen is brushed onto the pistil of another rose. In nature, this job is handled by the wind and by insects which carry the pollen from one flower to another on their wings and feet. But here it must be known exactly which roses are involved in the cross. And so to guard against stray insects, a paper bag is placed over the flower, which soon will bear the seeds of an entirely new rose. Like the roses, the corn being harvested here in Minnesota also is a hybrid grown for seed stock purposes. Combining the best qualities of various older varieties, this one was developed by Northrop King and Company for planting in a specific region where specific soil and climatic conditions prevail. As the wagon box is filled, it's towed to the husking and sorting tables where snapping rolls remove the husks. The men not only take care of husks the machine misses, but also cull out faulty ears as a preliminary to many other selective processes the corn will go through next at one of the company's five plants devoted solely to the preparation of seed corn. After drying, the corn is again checked off for off-shaped, immature, or damaged ears, and then the kernels are removed. At the seed laboratory in Minneapolis, meanwhile, samples from all the different processing plants are tested in germinators, which show what percentage will sprout and grow. In the case of these beans, it's 96 out of 100. Important information for the farmer. Also important is the reaction of the seeds in this germinator, which duplicates conditions that will prevail during a cold, damp, raw spring. Often such seed improvement work creates big new demand for a crop. A newly developed Bulgar type wheat, for example, can be cooked like rice, yet costs half as much. With it, the Washington State Wheat Growers Association is finding a big market in Korea where large quantities of low-cost food help us fight communism as well as hunger. 
Some seeds, notably beans, peas, and corn, must be hand-selected to get rid of those considered unsatisfactory. From this point on, machines will take over, sorting by weight, shape, and diameter. These are oats, another result of the careful breeding and processing that yield new, purer strains of seeds economically. To improve on our supply of apples, orchard men constantly search for a branch that bears perfect fruit. When they find one, chances are they'll send it along to Stark Brothers Nurseries and Orchards Company in Louisiana, Missouri, for sampling by experts who seek unusual flavor, texture, shape, and color. For a single branch of an apple tree, these men have paid as much as $6,000. As a result, they've been able to market entirely new varieties. To see how one branch can produce a forest in just a few years, we look in on the production of one of their more popular varieties, the dwarf apple tree. To the basic root stock of a French crab seedling is grafted a length of stem from a Virginia crab. One will provide strong roots, the other a hardy, rugged trunk. For protection until they've grown together, the grafts are wrapped with tape. One year later, branches are harvested from parent trees, which can be any one of dozens of varieties. These new branches are called scions. It's the scion that will determine what kind of fruit eventually will be born by a tree that, when finished, will include sections from four different types, in effect, a sort of homemade tree. Taken to the workrooms, the scions are now joined to the fourth component, sections of stem from dwarf trees. So now we have the root stock and trunk stock growing in the nursery, and in the final graft, the dwarfing stock and the apple producing stock are added. Thus, all the most desirable features of an apple tree finally have been brought together in one plant. Just the right amount of cultivation, fertilization, and spraying with the fungicides and insecticides which have played such a big part in improving all kinds of farming. It takes all this to explain why the apples we eat today are so superior to those grown a couple of generations ago that our forefathers would hardly identify them with what they used to call apples. Before being dug, the young trees are stripped of leaves. To get the trees out of the ground without damaging roots, the company has developed a mechanical digger that loosens the soil around them so the trees can be lifted out very gently. Men of the organization, which dates back to the time when this was Indian country, are proud of their contributions to horticulture. But perhaps their proudest boast is that when he died in 1926, the great Luther Burbank left them his entire stock of new plants and experiments, confident that they would continue his work in his own dedicated fashion. Meanwhile, experiments of even greater promise are being made possible by new tools of the atomic age. Here at the University of Michigan, for example, we see how a scientist armed with a Geiger counter can follow through stems and leaves the course of plant nutrients made radioactive. A tremendous aid in improving fertilizers, which already have multiplied farm productivity many times. Here in California's Hemet Valley, harvest time actually rolls around every 18 days. The crop is alfalfa. And after the top five inches that are most important to this grower have been harvested, the rest is cut down to the ground to be piled up in long compost rows together with certain minerals and farm waste. The process of decay, which ordinarily would take many months, is speeded up 
And within a few weeks, the mixture has been transformed into a rich black loam, first grade topsoil. This is scattered over the harvested field, putting back into the ground actually more of nature's wealth than was taken out of it. A harvest every 18 days with the help of modern scientific methods which constantly improve the soil. But soil isn't even necessary these days, as we see at this farm, which practices hydroponics, the science of farming in water. Here on an average size city lot on a busy Miami street, tomato plants grown with their roots suspended in a nutrient solution instead of in dirt, bring in a multi-thousand dollar crop each year. And tomatoes are only one of 13 crops harvested. Their water is pumped at regular intervals through an eight inch bed of gravel, bringing the plants not only moisture, but also a solution containing all the essential plant minerals. The gravel serves to hold the roots so they'll stay in place and absorb what they need to grow tremendously and produce big luscious fruits and vegetables. Starting with this dish of tomato seeds, Let's follow the cycle through. Planting is simplicity itself here at Flagler Hydroponics. No plowing or other soil preparation. No waiting on weather. Push back a handful of gravel, lay in the seeds and cover them up. The crops are fed and watered three times a day, just like people. It's done by opening a couple of valves. Chemical control of pests is easier, too, when a small area does the work of a hundred acres. With farm output near record highs, it's difficult to conceive of American food shortages. But experts say our population is growing so fast, we could have serious trouble feeding every American as early as 1975. A problem hydroponics could help us solve. Speed of growth under this system is amazing. The tomato seed planted a few days ago will produce its full quota in two and a half months. About six bushels from an area three feet by six. One more dramatic indication of the way science and industry, by giving nature a push in the right direction, lead us along toward a better, more healthful tomorrow. industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. <laughs>